notes are inspiring from gravity with very high energy general textbooks. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation uh, and for the additional five minutes, which I will probably need. Um, I will start bothering you with some experimental data. I will show you how our instruments in the very energy gamma ray regime work. So basically I will start off with an introduction showing you the observatories and the techniques we use. I will show you some objects of potential interest for this community. This is PULSAS, Active Galactic Nuclear Gamma Ray Bursts. I will also show you some results we obtained in the recent years, particularly on Macarin 521 and Parks 2155. These are two active galactic nuclei. And of course, I will also talk about gamma ray bursts, both in ground-based instruments and in fermi light and satellite point experiment. At the end of the talk, I will show you some capabilities of our instruments, which may be explored in the future. And I will show you also some more constraining methods than just time of light methods, which I will concentrate on in the talk. Just to give you an idea where we are, we are sitting here in the so-called very high energy domain. We observe photons uh, of energies of some 100 GeVs around that region. We are interested in observations, observing these objects. Why are we interested in photons in the first place? Um, the field was growing and maturing uh, with the search for the sources of cosmic rays, but the problem with cosmic rays is that we have intergalactic magnetic fields, so these cosmic rays uh, do not reveal their origin, but they are uh, kind of not coming directly from the source, but they undergo some, some detours. Um, instead, we look for gamma rays. So these gamma rays are inevitable byproducts of these cosmic ray observations, and they are, of course, not redirected. They come straight from the sources. The same is, of course, true for neutrinos. They are just much more difficult uh, to be detected on Earth. And the same is also true, I should say, for, for extremely high energy cosmic rays, like 10 to the 20 electron volts. Um, what are the basic um, production mechanisms of those photons? We have two classes of models. One is the leptonic model. In the leptonic model, uh, synchrotron photons are created by electrons, and these electrons re encounter those uh, photons once more, give them a kick by the inverse Compton process, and we end up with TV photons. An alternative class of models are hadronic models. Basically, we have hadronic interactions, pions are created, and inevitably you have pi zeros, which inevitably go to gamma gamma. There is, of course, also more speculative sources of, of these gamma rays, for example, the annihilation of dark matter. But these are the main production processes which we think are at work in our sources. Let me show you the instruments we are using to observe these GBTV gamma rays. There is, of course, the Fermi satellite. It's uh, sensitive up to some 10 GeV. Then it runs out of statistics. It's a primary detection instrument, so it's a, it's a particle physics detector in space. It has, however, a small effective area. The, the, the detector area is about one square meter. It has a large angular acceptance, a large duty site. It can basically observe all the time. And has a low and quite well understood background, however, a high cost. The ground-based in instruments rely on a secondary detection uh, technique. I will show you in a few seconds. We have a large effective area, so these instruments have a detection area of about 10 to the 5 square meters. Compare this to the 1 square meter of the satellite. Um, we have, however, a, a rather small angular acceptance, so we need to know at what sources we want to look. We cannot observe or survey the whole sky. Um, we have a high background, so we have to understand how to uh, uh, distinguish cosmic gamma rays charged particles, which do not reveal the direction uh, from, the, uh, from the gamma rays we're interested in but we have a low cost. So these instruments really cost just a few million euros as compared to, I think, 500 million euros, which Fermi cost in the end. This is the key players in the ground-based business. There is the magic telescope on the Canary Island of La Palma, Veritas in Arizona, they cover the northern hemisphere, HES is in Namibia, and there is also a Japanese experiment located at, uh, in Australia, but they have some funding problems, so I would consider the first three mentioned uh, instruments, the active ones, and you see we cover the whole, um, both hemispheres, we have a timely coverage here, so basically we have covered the whole sky with these instruments. How does our observation technique work? As I mentioned, it's a secondary detection technique. Cosmic ray enters the atmosphere, it creates a cascade of secondary particles, electrons and positrons, 
in which a strength of light in the atmosphere, the strength of light illuminates uh, an area of about 10 to the 5 square meters of ground. And what we do is we put a very sensitive light detector in this area, which uh, provides us with pictures, photos of those air showers. And of course, the direction of the air shower, the brightness of the air shower tells us something about the direction of the incoming cosmic ray or gamma ray and about the energy. So we can basically reconstruct the, the gamma ray flux of the objects we're interested in. This is an hadronic event. This is an event which comes from a charged cosmic ray. So this is background for us. As you can see, we can, by image analysis, very well discriminate those background events, which are by a factor of 1,000 more numerous from the events we're interested in. And I should mention that this ground-based technique works excellent at 100 GVs and above. Below it becomes challenging, but with magic at least we have shown that we can very well work also in this low-energy domain. Just as an example for those other telescopes which exist, this is how the magic telescope looks, looks like. It's a two-telescope installation on the Canary Island of La Palma. Each telescope has a reflective area of about 17 meter diameter. And these are the basic performance numbers. We can go down to uh, uh, detecting gamma rays uh, to energies of about 30 GeV. The standard sensitivity is below 1% of the Pratt Nebula, which is in our field of astrophysics the standard unit, how to measure our sensitivity. We have a rather modest angular resolution, a modest energy resolution. We have a rather good time resolution of the order of microseconds, where the intrinsic fluctuations in those air showers is on um, the order of nanoseconds. And I should mention we can observe only during dark time, so no moon is allowed. Magic is an exception to that, uh, thanks to a special detector technique. Uh, we can also observe during moonlight, so this uh, extends our duty cycle. For example, if a gamma ray burst is going off uh, during moonshine, we can still follow up this gamma ray burst. I should also mention that these telescopes are rather lightweight, the magic telescopes weigh about 60 tons each only, and they have a very, very powerful driving system, so we can follow up each position in the sky in about 15 to 20 seconds, which means uh, we cannot, of course, get the prompt phase of a gamma ray burst. Maybe if it lasts a bit longer, we can do that. But the afterglow phase can now be uh, followed up with these telescopes, if they're lucky. A few words on the space phase instruments. The Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, you have certainly all heard of. It's a NASA satellite. It has been launched in summer 2008, it's now two years in orbit. There's basically two instruments on it. The Large Area Telescope, it's a one square meter um, particle detector in space. It consists of silicon trackers and a calorimeter. It's sensitive to about 100 GeV, where it runs out of statistics. And there is also the so-called gamma ray burst monitor. It works at lower energies, but it has a very large field of view, so it can really see the gamma ray bursts uh, during, during the first initial phase. This is some um, performance numbers. You see the energy resolution in the high energy region. It's also modest. This is the beamer. This is not my computer. Can we switch off this somehow? It's on. It's gone. Perfect. Should I keep this? Can we blow it? Yeah. <laughs> I just pressed one other button and it worked. That's fine. Um, so basically, you see this, uh, the performance facts. The interesting thing here: the point source localization is very good, so gamma ray bursts could be identified uh, very accurately, and also the time resolution is good, which is interesting if you wanna uh, have a time uh, if you wanna have uh, time analysis of your gamma ray burst in terms of quantum gravity analysis. something very interesting happening in the slides, I will tell you. Um, so this is the status of gamma ray of some <laughs> <laughs> That was the wrong one. Okay, so that's...
Also, im Menü geht nicht. Dann kommt es Kein Problem. Also, I will go on to this slide. It's text anyway. So, this is the status of, of uh, what we can do in, in gamma rays. I would say the field has measured quite significantly in the last eight years. We had about six sources before, now we have about 100 sources. Most of them are galactic, but about one third is extra galactic, which is interesting to this audience. We have four major ground based telescopes. We have one water track of telescope, which I did not mention at all. You can ask me about it later on if you want. And we have a hugely successful satellite experiment firm. Uh, the current telescopes can observe between 100 MeV and some 10 TeV. So that's a huge energy span. If you observe an object, if you want to make time of flight measurements, differences in the time of evolution, which is interesting for this audience, these instruments are very well suited for it. We are quite sensitive to about half a percent of the crab nebula, I will try to still get the same. Uh, which means uh, we can do a very fine time uh, study of those objects. So we can study these light curves in a very fine way. I have written here, we have some survey capabilities, that's certainly true, but only for the galactic plane, because our uh, pointing, uh, our field of view is very small. Um, now I want to start going into studies with those instruments which are relevant for this audience. And this slide is basically only to tell you that the main business for us is uh, to make a time study. So this means what you want to understand is is there any time lags in the spectra, in the, uh, in the time evolution of the, of the photons which we see from those objects. So this is basically what this cartoon should tell you. If we know that photons of the same energy start off at, at the same time at the source, and we can observe that they arrive at us, at the observer, at different times, then this time difference uh, tells us basically something about a time lag which could either be intrinsic to the source or which could be due to the travel in the medium, which is of course relevant for Lorentz invariance relation studies. So what we basically need, we need, we need very fast signals, yeah? because uh, the faster we are, the, the more sensitive we are on quantum gravity effects. Uh, those signals, however, must provide a timestamp caused by simultaneous emission of different gamma rays. At the, or at, the, at the source, and that's of course very, very complicated to prove because there are source intrinsic mechanisms at work. Uh, I really try to get this away. Yeah. So basically, the, the quantum gravity mass scale we are <laughs> sensitive to depends on three factors. It depends on the distance of the object to us. Obviously, the further away the object is, the better, the more sensitive we are. It depends on the energy difference. And this is really where our instruments come in, because we can observe to some 10 TVs, and the low energy is probably some 10 GVs. So that's a factor 10 to the 3. This you don't get from any other instrument. And it's, of course, this delta T, you know, which is in the denominator, which means the finer the time structures we are able to resolve, the better. Oh, that's perfect. The plot is on the right side. You can just see it. Um, just to show you what we can do. Uh, two years ago, we observed the crab pulsar. That's a very close-by object. You would say it's not so interesting. But it's a pulsar. In magic, was the only instrument which could observe the pulse emission. So here you see the, the crab phase, you know, the rotation phase of the pulsar. And this is 33 milliseconds. It's a very, very short time scale. In the binning, it's just a bit analysis. You see that these bins are of the, of, of the order of milliseconds or less. So even though the object is very close, we can do a Lorentz invariance violation study with this object. Uh, I could also show you here that you can, it's a very, it's a pity, this is the pulsar spectrum, and you see the cutoff of the pulsar is here. This is few 10 GeVs, and all the previous experiments, only at upper limits in this region, it goes up to 100, 200 GeV. The magic measurement is right here. So you see, we measure right on the cutoff. Uh, Fermi, of course, measures <coughs> a little bit down in energy here. So with Fermi, you get about 30 pulsars at this point. Um, but the TV instruments give you the maximum energy difference. So that might be quite interesting for quantum gravity measurements. And we have not published any results on this yet. So this is a real back of the envelope calculation. This would give you limits of the order of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 GV. That's not so much, you would say. It's far away from the Planck scale. But this is a very well understood emission mechanism. You can trust in what the source does which gives even these low limits some, some, some... Do we get another beamer? Or, yeah.
uh, it, it has to be taken down to service. Okay. Um, so, what I wanted to, to say is here the emission mechanism is very well understood, so this gives some extra credibility to those uh, limits which you get. I will now skip to sources which are much further away. This is extra galactic sources, so called active galactic nuclei. They are not as distant as gamma ray bursts, but uh, for these objects, we have an edge on satellites. We are much more sensitive, yeah? so we can. Um, really study these light curves in great detail at very high energies. Um, what are active galactic nuclei, in particular blazers? Uh, these are galaxies, and a small fraction of those galaxies we call active. They have supermassive black holes in their centers. These are black holes of 10 to 6 to 10 to 10 solar masses. And they are treat matter. And to get rid of the angular momentum, they have to expel quite a bit of this matter along these so-called jets, so these are relativistic exhaust, if you so want, uh, collimated relativistic jets, and if we happen to observe directly to those jets, we call those objects blazers. And in fact, these are the AGNs which, which ground-based telescopes mainly uh, detected so far. We have detected about 30 AGNs and 90% of blazers. So if, such a, in, if in such a blazer, matter is expelled in the jet, you might see what we call a flare. This is a, um, an event in which we see very, very many photons, and these flares have structures, and we can analyze those structures. But I should warn you, we don't know much about those blazers and the flares yet. We really don't know in detail what are the variability timescales, what is the real origin of gamma rays. I showed you these two model classes before. We don't know really what are the physical conditions in the jet so, such, so that such a flare happens if we don't know the reason for the variability. So whenever we use such events to study quantum gravity, we must be aware that there can be quite some source intrinsic effects going on. This again is magic observation. The interesting part is not covered by the gray area. So we look at a close by bright blazer Macarian 501 for about 60 days in 2005. You see the different uh, observations down here. It's below the trap nebula flux, so it's quiescent, but we had two nights where we saw so-called flares, outbursts of this object. Um, these are these flares. Uh, you can basically see for about one hour there's nothing, and then the flux increases and goes down. We fitted abortion here just for convenience. And there is another flare hidden here. So there were two nights in 2005 where we saw those flares. Now what's interesting about these flares is if we look at them in different energy ranges, you see this is a light curve to so different energy ranges, you might see that the peak of those light curves is shifting. So that was the first time in, in this TV energy band that we saw a shift um, from low to high energies. So you might wonder, is this a quantum gravity effect? Of course it can be, it can also be a source intrinsic effect. Even more difficulties arise if you look at the second flare. It looks totally different. So there's nothing in, in three or four energy bands, but there is something which we <coughs> could call a flare. So the non-flare probability is two per mil. So you see those flares. The behavior of the evolution is quite different. There's no universality seen yet. This is, again, the first flare where we tried to understand if there's a time delay. And in fact, we tried to quantify the delay. Wow, I cannot even read what I've written here. Sorry for that. So the zero delay probability, so that there is no delay, is 3 per mil. So this is a 2.6 sigma effect. But it's the first time something like this has been seen. How can we, how can we explain this? Of course, first, the intrinsic effects, a gradual acceleration of electrons in the source can account for this delay. We have also shown that if there is a blob emitted in the jet and the blob is gradually, gradually um, um, accelerated, then this can also account for such a delay. Yeah? And also, if you just very briefly enhance the, the amount of electrons in that source, this can cause a delay. But if you, of course, assume that the photons have all been emitted simultaneously at the object, then the effect must be extrinsic, and then it can be Lorentz invariance violation. As the effect is only 2.6 sigma, and as we cannot uh, reject any source intrinsic effects, we just derived an upper limit, which is about 2% of the Planck scale for this particular event. Just to show you how those, those intrinsic models would work, there is a block of electrons, the block goes down the jet, it's accelerated while it goes down the jet, 
and they always emit photons at the highest energies which is available to that law. If you, if you make up this, if you do this model and if you go through the calculations, then you see that the distance of acceleration here is very small. It can be really close to the black hole. The interesting thing about this model, however, is there's a clear prediction the time delays should grow with going to lower energies. So if you ever observe a flare simultaneously at Fermi and with these TV instruments ground-based, then we should see in Fermi a delay of minutes in the ground-based instruments, a delay of seconds, and then we can have proven that there's some source intrinsic effect going on. To show you an even more dramatic uh, event, one year later observed by our friends from the Hess telescopes, this is the magic, well, this was the magic event. <laughs> <laughs> So this is from the competitors, so they don't want to yeah. Anyways, this event was much more dramatic. You see the light curve is a fine structure which is caused by some source intrinsic effects. And you see also they have a huge statistics, 10,000 gamma rays. Um, um, they used a very dedicated analysis. Also, I have to say for the 501, we didn't simply use a time billing, we used a photon by photon analysis. And they come a little bit closer to the Planck scale. So they have inferred a limit of order 6 times 10 to the 18 uh, with this dramatic flare. So these were basically the flares which have been observed and used for quantum gravity studies with ground-based instruments. <coughs> um, I want to show you some more possibilities which we have with those instruments. The first uh, thing I want to show you is we can go much further in redshift. So uh, this is also a blazer. And what I wanted to show you here, this blazer in the TV range has a very high variability. The flux can vary on a by hour by a factor of 100. And this is, uh, again, a magic light curve, and there was nothing observed. All these data points here have been compatible with zero, but in one night, during one and a half hours, we observed <laughs> a highly significant signal of this object. So what is interesting? The interesting thing is this object is very far away. The lever arm is quite a bit larger than for the AGNs I showed you before, and it has a very short flaring time scale. So once our instruments become a little bit more sensitive, we might be able to resolve time structures in these very short outbursts of this object. Two good news. First good news is we saw it again in January 2007, so this was not a one-shot observation. This object does this more often. The second good news is we have discovered two weeks ago a similar object, also a very powerful blazer, at a redshift of over four. So these faraway objects exist. They also perform flares, flaring episodes, as the objects I showed you before. So. The other interesting thing I should mention is um, we kind of have a problem because at TeV energies, those TeV <coughs> photons can interact with starlight, with ambient starlight, which is everywhere in the universe, which kind of is the history of the universe. And you see how much uh, the, uh, uh, the attenuation is, this is different redshifts. And basically, the redshift of order 5, uh, everything above 200 GeV is totally attenuated. This means we cannot go to these very high energies at when observing very far away sources. Just to give you some idea where we sit, this is starlight, this is reflected starlight, and this is the cosmic microwave background, this is wavelengths. So these two photon fields kind of uh, make it impossible to observe objects which are very far away. Um, you know, this plot I would really like to show you. Let me try to... Yeah, perfect. So what you see here is, again, the distance of the sources, the redshift, and you see here the maximum gamma ray energy we can observe. Now the question is, how dense is this EPL, this background light? The, the more dense it is, the, the less far we can look. And what we have uh, shown with this Lisi to Zerbal observation is that previous models, which told us that the EPL density is, is high, are excluded. So we basically are left with the almost minimum EBL density. We can look as far as we can with all the stars in the universe. So there is just the, 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 the star from galaxies. And this is, of course, interesting for this community. We can observe AGMs even at faraway distances. You can see this is the magic energy threshold, so we can probably go to redshifts of two. This is also, of course, important for gamma ray bursts. I mentioned this EBL simply also because they have been claimed in the, in the literature that uh, possibly uh, the gamma ray horizon or the maximum distance we can look is modified if quantum gravity is at work. So basically this reaction is enhanced, which means more high energy photons get lost, the gamma ray horizon is shortened. This means if we observe the gamma ray horizon very precisely, 
it may be that we can say something about quantum gravity by those measurements, but that's certainly for the future. Another thing is laser absorption features. Uh, it can be that this reaction is modified such that we cannot observe high energy photons even from close by blazers, from Macarin 501, Macarin 421. And this means this spectra, because these objects are very bright, can be measured very precisely. Yeah? We can go to some 10 TeVs, and by measuring those spectra, we can probably also infer something about the modification of this process. But uh, you are very sensitive to the uncertainty of the background in this case, no? No, not really. I should have mentioned that our background sensitivity is mainly there at low energies. At these high energies, the ground-based instruments are basically background-free. So we can measure very precisely spectra from, say, 5 TV on. It's just a matter of statistics and time. You surely know that a while ago there was uh, people claiming that there was a crisis because of the data about the absorption of gamma rays from, exactly from the Macari. This was exactly this EBL crisis because they assumed the EBL must be very high and they were wondering why at all they see the high energy gamma rays. But this crisis is solved since two or three years because now these EBL models which I showed you basically tell us that we're here at the, at the minimum EBL we can imagine. This is, if you just count all galaxies, you count all stars, then this is already all the light which is in the EBL. And previously the models told us there should be much higher EBL, and that was called a crisis. I, I think you refer to this crisis, isn't it? Where would the light come from? Say it again? Where would the light come from? Ah. from stars and galaxies? Well, the starlight is basically the entire accumulated starlight over the history of the universe, which for us is also interesting because the further away we get, uh, the closer we get to the star formation epoch, so we learn something about the history of the universe. The second component of this EBL is dust. So, so this is starlight reflected by dust, therefore going into the infrared regime. It's just the accumulated photon history of the universe in the optical. So, so what about so what was modified in the, in the, in the, in the star formation is later in the, in the model? Star formation is preferred later, or is less dust? It's it's less intense if you so want. Yeah, um, they in, in the earlier models there was a high star forming rate which was in excess of what was directly observed from galaxy counts. Um, this is too bad, I should show you this plot. <laughs> yeah, okay. The, the data, uh, it's a very, okay, you see here uh, wavelengths, this is the, the lower limits from the galaxy counts, and for example, here there was an excess reported by a satellite experiment, but this could later on not, uh, not be confirmed, and you see in, in color the different models, Earlier models, for example, the Stecker model has a fast evolution, a fast star formation, so the stars are already there very early. Yeah. Um, and so this is a high EBL density, but the lower models, which now seem to be compatible with what we observe in TEV, they don't have this anymore. So, just uh, to clarify, because you know, in the 2003, there was already people trying to put constraints on balance violation exactly with this paper production. And the problem was the background, because uh, there were too many models creating uh, different background, there was this uncertainty. So at the, some point uh, it was very difficult to, to, to say yeah. anything definitive. So the point we are making is that nowadays uh, we are pretty sure about the background, in this yes. sense. Uh, yes. And uh, the region in which we are looking, where the absorption is taking place, is a region where uh, for uh, the shift you, would, uh, you are trying to basically, you don't expect uh, a strong sensitivity. Is this your point? Yes. Okay. So, these EBL models, I would claim, have now converged to models at, at the lowest possible EBL. And every now and then a new model is coming up in the literature, but they all are at the very low edge of what is possible. And this is also confirmed by our TV observations. So, yes, I would say this crisis is gone, and you can trust in these EBL models quite a bit more than you could about five years ago. <coughs> Yes. Okay, this should just show you where, where all this is going uh, with the time of flight observations. Basically, I calculated a factor of 70 which we can, which we can get better in sensitivity with ground-based instruments. Um, this comes first of all from the fact that we can go to higher energies 
we have to fight the steep spectra. The steepening of the spectra comes from this EBN absorption. So this means at high energies, we run out of statistics even faster than the sources provide us with high energy photons. With. But still, as we get to more higher sensitivity instruments with the follow-up instruments of magic and HESS, effective three seems possible. More sensitivity also means that we are sensitive to faster variations or to flares and subflares with shorter timescales. So this means timescales which are known flares, which are typically of the order of, of some minutes, would go to some fraction of minutes, which would give us another factor of five. Uh, and as already mentioned, we think we can go now to, to objects which are further away. This is another factor of five at least. So this gives us, if you're optimistic, a factor 100 to 200 on the 10% of the Planck scale with these ground-based instruments. Uh, Fermi, I would guess that um, the limits can, or that the measurements can increase by a factor of maybe 20, the further they get away uh, with gamma ray bursts and the more gamma ray bursts they find. Um, finally, I want to give you some updates on gamma ray bursts, just very shortly only. Uh, this is how Fermi looks at gamma ray bursts. So there's an intrinsic emission, emission structure in these gamma ray bursts, and admittedly it might be complex. Both the light curves are complex, but also the location, the origin of the different photons is quite unclear. The common assumption in all these analysis which Fermi does is that the high energy photons are emitted during an episode of low energy photon emission, where high energy photons are some 10 GeV low energies are a fraction of GeV. They cannot, however, assume the end of the low energy uh, emission safely, so only positive delays are constrainable. And what was interesting for me when reading the literature is that they, there, there is spectral lags present in all these gamma ray bursts, this we know, but they are only present in the sub MeV range, so they should not be present in the high energy range. This, to my mind, should be discussed because also in the high energy range, I would, I would figure that intrinsically there should be delays expected in gamma ray bursts. I show you here just a slide on the analysis of the gamma ray burst on 9 or 510. This gamma ray burst is interesting because of various reasons. It's very far away, high level arm. They have seen, this is a spectrum, 130.5 GB photon, which is of course very cool for us ground-based observers, because this is where we become sensitive some 20, 25 GBs and above. And just imagine, they have a collection area of, of one square meter. We have 10,000 square meters. So there should be around 10,000 photons, if you so will. So it's for us ground-based observers just a matter of getting to the gamma ray burst as fast as possible, if we manage to do so. And if we see those photons, then we have a really high level arm in gamma ray burst observations and a high statistics. Um, one word of caution. For the, for the Fermi gamma ray burst, I found it very irritating that this is the spectrum they, they fit. So they have here and here a band function. That's the usual function to describe gamma ray burst emission. But they also have an intermittent power law component, which tells me that those two components may well originate from different locations in the gamma ray burst. So even if we derive, um, even if we derive limits from those gamma ray bursts, we need to be aware that most likely the photons come from different locations. They may have just totally different creation uh, mechanisms. So it's, to my mind, a very delicate business. Just to show you what we can do with the ground-based instruments, uh, we have observed about 50 gamma ray bursts since 2005. Um, we are triggered by satellite experiments, so we have a certain latency. The trigger takes about 15 seconds to reach magic, and I mentioned earlier that we need about 20 seconds to go to the location of the gamma ray burst, so we are late by about 25, 30 seconds, and we only can observe in the, in the late, in the, in the afterglow phase. This is a list of those gamma ray bursts. We have not seen anything yet. We can just put other limits there. Um, the list is much shorter than, about fi than the 50 bursts I mentioned, simply because for some of those bursts we don't have good data quality or we came much too late, or the redshift is unknown, which makes the object uninteresting for quantum gravity uh, studies. Um, just to show you some light curves, yeah, this is the swift light curve, the X-ray light curve, this is where magic started observations. So, of course, we missed the burst. The same here. Then there was this very 
yeah, unfortunate burst. It was right at sunset. So it was a strong burst, if you remember, 08 or 09. <coughs> the strongest burst. It was even visible for the naked eye as far as I remember the optical. Um, and our software didn't allow us to go there because the sun was rising. It was too bright. But had we gone there, yeah, we would have started observations while the, the outburst phase was still going on. So that would have been a really good shot. Yeah. And here is another of those gamma ray bursts we observed. Yeah, this already brings me to my summary. I would claim that at this time, both spaceborne and ground based gamma ray instruments are very major instruments, very powerful tools. We have a couple of objects, pulsars, AGNs, gamma ray bursts which are able to provide relevant signatures for time-of-flight measurements, which are interesting for this community. Um, population studies are likely to start. I mention this because whenever you observe a, an isolated event in one object, you can never be sure whether what you have seen is source intrinsic or not. But once you have 30 outbursts, or 100 outbursts, or 30 gamma ray bursts, you can be sure. You can, you can disentangle source intrinsic and extrinsic effects. And I should mention the follow-up experiments the ground-based follow-up experiments will provide us with at least 10 times higher sensitivity and with at least 1,000 sources as compared to the 100 sources we observe right now. So there's a lot of potential in these future instruments. A gamma reverse in the TV range was probably sensational, both for our community but also for your community. And I try to show you all also some non-time-of-flight-based strategies which can be used with our instruments. So thanks very much and please apologize for this. Yes. Is there strong, is, it has that, has, can you test that assumption? Well, as I said, for, for me just this, this spectrum looks a bit irritating because a band function and a power law point to totally different <coughs> emission mechanisms. And of course this didn't go in the analysis. They just made this assumption the high energy photon must come during the low energy episode and not before the first low energy photon. But still, the spectrum tells me there could be totally different locations, right? There could, so, to me, it's not clear whether those two photons have been emitted at the same time and at the same location, the gamma ray burst. And th that, that was the first time I saw such a fit, obviously, because data quality before Fermi was not that good. Um, but this just tells me we need to be very careful. they have 10 events from 1 to 10 GV. So even if they are not emitted, you can still put a strong limit. Yes. Because the burst is very short. So even, uh, I mean, uh, leaving aside the important issue of the emission, the limit, I think, is robust. The limit is fine. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, but you can basically make no claims. Pardon? You can not make any claims. Oh, no. But I mean, the limit... But the yeah, the limit... Uh, Maybe, maybe the point I want to make is even if you have a large population of gamma ray bursts and even if you may start to disentangle intrinsic and extrinsic effects, this may be an additional complication which has to be taken into account. That we start to understand the gamma ray bursts better and better, that we start to understand these light curves, uh, these spectra better and better. Sorry, this is the point. This is from the uh, trump Yes. So basically we don't know anything about the mechanism now at the moment, we are still at the level of this is also why I advertise these AGNs so much. I mean, I, I try to convince <coughs> you that we don't know much about the AGNs, but we know significantly more than about the gamma ray burst prompt emission. So, <laughs> more than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is the distance for the ground-based instruments. We can still observe AGNs. Yeah, that's my point. So for me, the good news of this burst is we could also view so far, we could, we could observe so far away, and there is photons which make it over this distance. Because these photons are also EBL affected, of course.
So I, I was confused by something you said in a, in a side sentence, which was that if the redshift is not known, the, uh, the object is uh, uninteresting for quantum gravity effects. So why is that? Well, you cannot get derive any limits, isn't it? Because to, 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 to get the sensitivity or the, to get this delta t, you need to know the distance. I mean, it doesn't help if you don't know the distance of the object and you have some time structure. Well, you would still have, well, it's an energy dependence, basically, right? So it's true. So that, that shouldn't be there. And it gets larger, the larger, the further away the object is, sure. But That's true, yes. I, I, it's, it seems feasible to me that there might be some observable where you, where that's not redshift dependent that you could kind of construct. <coughs> this is very true, yes, I agree. So even if you don't know the distance and you still see some universal feature, you could attribute it to source intrinsic mechanisms. That, that's the point you want to make, isn't it? Yeah, okay. And the rest, although the distance we don't know, should be extrinsic. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so ex excuse my ignorance. <coughs> uh, it appears that at some point you're going to, yeah, assuming you don't see any signal, you exclude uh, the, the linear deviation from the, the usual Lorentz variant result. Uh, coefficient of order one. Yes, with right. the factor of 100 I mentioned. Yes. Right, so, so I have sort of a general question. Uh, is how small the coefficient in front of that term is interesting? And I assume that a quadratic term is impossible to access, not just by your methods, but by any method, is this true? Well, the quadratic term, we also put a limit on it <laughs> with a 5 for 1 um, study we did, and that limit was better than the previous limits. So they are not totally out of scope. Um, but the question is for the future, can we really improve on it? I doubt it. That's true. Well, there are constraints on the, the point is that uh, with the ultra with the ultra energy cosmic rays, you predict that they are production by the GDK quantum subpines, the phi zero decay into gammas. The gammas are very high energy, around ten to the minute. And uh, the assumption of this gamma can be used to test constraints on the um, basically quadratic suppressing n plus square term and store them in the dispersion energy and the constraint is to be one. And that's probably much more robust than what we do because this is an understood mechanism. Right. Yeah, but, they, but you need to use a full effective field. Yeah, um, the, one, of the, one of what's the situation with putting constraints on the advanced effect? That's a good. That's a good question. We didn't. I'm not aware of any current studies on this. Actually, I mean, I, I can all, only tell you that this can also be modeled, source intrinsically. So, get sure. back. Get back at the. Uh, but I cannot give you numbers because I'm really not aware of any. Nick, do you know anything? For the advance, I think there are not strong limits because no. the tails are uh, not. Yeah. I mean, for photons, because yeah. synchrotron radiation is a different issue. In fact, synchrotron radiation, if, if the dispersion relations are the same for electrons, they can put. Uh, sure. But that's a different. Uh, now, for photons, I think they, they, are, they, they cannot. Superluminal, uh, superluminal, they cannot. Which is surprising. But the, because I think it's their accuracy in measuring. It's what you said as well, the tails of the. But, but it's a tough business. I mean, if you can model delays, yeah. yeah. If you well, manage, to, sorry, if yeah. you manage to measure lower energies in your uh, AGNs, then you could uh, say maybe uh, because the lower energies would be delayed if there are super Yeah, I mean, it, from when people start doing statistics on the Fermi data, it must become possible. Because yeah. if, if there were a large superluminal effect, somebody would see a, a G D or ten G photon first before the other photon. Yeah, this is by statistic. Mm. Yeah, this is true. I don't know of any such high energy photon having been observed significantly before some low energy, mm. before something happened low energy. Okay, but now let, let me ask you a related question. Yeah. Um, is fairly set up supposing that there were an event where a where ten or a fifty G came you know, a, a second or a fraction of a second before the KDV. 
with Fermi trigger? Is Fermi set up to give Fermi notice in a pattern like that? I would guess no. If the outburst at these high energies were very strong, yes. But they run out of statistics, so they would probably not trigger. They would probably not trigger. But to, to, does that mean that, that Fermi could have missed a, uh, a that in one of the Fermi events there could have been a, a, a 10 GV photon that came out? Well, they, they don't miss anything because it, it's not that they start observing only when they trigger. Okay. They observe all the time. They, they see the whole sky every 90 minutes. So it's all in data. And it was written on the slides, I didn't mention, it's very important. Fermi data are public, the tools are public. Any of you can do this analysis. So you can search in the data set. Yeah? Nothing is lost. Um, but they would, one thing is true, they would of course not trigger SWIFT. Probably not, because the statistics is not high enough. So what you mentioned, First, a GB photon, and then the, the KB photons from Swift. This would probably not work. Yeah. I should maybe mention one thing which I have been asked, and which I should have mentioned in the slides, of course. The question which I have been asked in the previous meeting, the question was, why can't Fermi trigger the TV ground-based instruments? Why isn't there a fast lane to, to trigger, right? It seems the analysis takes some time. And uh, if, it won't, if they could trigger us, it would be perfect. They observe from some 100 MEVs on, we observe some 100 GEVs, some 10 TEVs, so that would be a huge handle in energy. But that seems not possible, unfortunately. There's uh, no more questions, and I, I think we will thank uh, Robert again. <laughs> and uh, we'll make a coffee break and see that we uh, exchange the beam on the way. Zumindest war ich vor zwei Monaten mal hier. Ich Thanks to